Hallo! Only one more thing left to do. If I hit play, the particles appear here on the right and disappear here on the left. Um, I want to change that. I want to scale them up once they enter this cube and want to scale them down shortly before they leave it so it's a little bit smoother. How would we achieve such a wonder? I know that I want to scale them, so I'm going to search for a scale instances node. That's an easy start. And usually, let's be honest, we always have to search for a combine XYZ node at some point. So let's just connect it up right away. Type in once, we get our original scale back. Since we want to scale them based on their own position, remember if they are close to the edge of our cube, we will obviously also need a position node and we will need the locations of the walls of the cube. And we already got that one. That's the min and max output from our bounding box node inside of this particle distributor from episode number one. Let's separate X, Y and Z and take a look at the y value of the position node because we're kind of looking at the y axis right now. So I'm going to connect it to x, for example, and you can see now something happened in the middle there, which is we have scaled down every particle on the x coordinate close to the center because the center has a value of zero and everything beyond that has either a positive or negative value. Now, the particles have become spiky because I've only scaled them on the x axis. So let's also plug it into the y axis. Now everything is great again. We don't need to bother with the z x because it's, it's a plane. It only has two axes. I mean, hey, that's almost what we want. We just kind of need the opposite, right? We want it big in the middle and small at the outside. And you would think that this conversion flipping it around should be rather easy. It's not that simple though, because one problem arises once I scale up my cube here. Whoa, do you see that? My particles get bigger. Because we don't stop at a nice value of one here, we actually stop nowhere. If the particles reach a value of 10,000, the particles are going to be 10,000 times bigger. Not ideal. So it's easy to flip around a value between one and zero. It's hard to flip around a value between zero and a random number that we don't know yet. So we will have to convert it into a number between zero and one. And zero ideally in our case shouldn't even start at the center, but at the most left part and one should start at the most right part so we can find 0.5, which then should be precisely in the middle because in such a scenario as this one, we don't want the biggest part of the particles to be here at the left. We would like it to be here in the center. How do I convert something into a value between one and zero? I divide it by its own size. Wow, sounds complicated, but let's imagine that this cube is six units wide or 6.2, for example. So if we divide 6.2 by 6.2, well, we get one. So this rightmost point would be one. And the point 3.1 divided by 6.2 would be 0.5, so half of it. And we have to do that three times for each axis. Luckily, it's the same thing three times, so it's not that difficult once we have passed the first hurdle. Now, in order to determine where a point is, for example, let's say this arbitrary particle here, I would need to know its distance from the leftmost side of the cube. So I could look at the minimum value of our bounding box and just measure the distance from that point on the y-axis to our particle. And then I can divide said value by the size of the entire cube on the y value and then get this arbitrary position as a wonderful value between 0 and 1. Now we have learned that we can get a vector between two points by simply subtracting them from each other and that is simply what we're going to do. So in conclusion, I take the location of my particle on one axis, subtract from that the leftmost point from my bounding box and then I want to divide that by the entire size of the cube which I would get by subtracting the leftmost point from the rightmost point. Let me show you how that looks in terms of nodes. We've already got a separate x, y, z. Let's get two more. The middle one, well, it doesn't really matter which one, I'm going to connect to the minimum value and the other one to the maximum value. So let's go to utility and math nodes. We are obviously working with a single value because we've separated our vector and you can see this indicated by the gray points. Now I'm setting it to subtract and that's the uh, first part of the equation. Position of the point minus position of the leftmost value. I actually don't think it 
really matters mathematically um, if I accidentally mix up min and max. Um, but you know, we will see what happens. Now we have to subtract the y from the minimum, from the y from the maximum, and we got our second length. And now we just have to divide both values through each other. And I forgot to set it from subtract to divide as I've promised before. And now let's, for example, just plug it into x and y for now and see what happens. Well, it's the opposite way now that I promised. So actually on the left we have a value of 1 and at the right we have a value of 0. But that doesn't matter because we have achieved what we want. A good way to test it out if, if we increase the size of the cube, um, the overall size of the particles uh, on the left or at the right should not change. As you can see, even if I stretch it out way far here, the particles have roughly the same size as compared to a smaller cube. Let me quickly make a little bit more space so we can see more clearly. I will go to color, select the color ramp and put it in here. And my particles have disappeared. And that is actually something that can happen to you. And I'm happy to explain to you why. A color ramp can only work from values from zero to one. And we've done some little switcheroo here uh, on the subtract nodes. So we actually didn't have a value from zero to one, but from zero to minus one. Just from the looks of it, they look the same. We can't really tell if they are scaled negatively or positively, but obviously since the color ramp value has clamped our values, well, now every value is zero. That's a very easy fix though. The only thing I have to do is switch around the subtraction between our point and the minimum value or maximum value or whatever that one is. And our particles have reappeared. Wonderful. And now what I originally wanted to do before we went on this tangent is, well, black obviously is a size of zero. And now I just want to have black on the right side as well. So let's move over this white value to the center and let's create a new handle, set it to black. And wow, now let's hit play. And as you can see, the particles fade in and out, at least when we only take a look at the Y axis. They still plop in at the top and bottom, but that we can fix rather simply. I think it would be cool to have a little bit more contrast here. So I'm going to move over this white handle to there and make another one here so the fall off is a little bit less smooth. Well, and now the duplication game begins. We just have to do the same thing two more times. And there's probably a mathematically more easy way. I just think this is already a complicated thing to explain. And using this method seems to be, I guess, as simple to understand as possible given the subject matter. So on my copies, I've just switched the Y inputs to X and Z respectively. And now essentially got the same thing for the other two axes. And in order to combine them all together at the end, I will simply take a look for the good old utilities math node, set it to multiply. We expect all of our mathematical calculations here to return a value from zero to one. So if I multiply one by one, it will remain one. So nothing will change in the middle. However, all the um, edges of the cube that will return zero will essentially cancel each other out. Um, and so we should be able to combine all three nodes rather simply like that. Now multiply, multiply, and we don't need the combine X, Y, Z node now. We can just uh, delete it and it should work. The last thing I will do is I will search for a switch node, set it to float, type in one in the false input and plug it in between here. And well, we should have connected this one to true. Now, if I switch it on, edge fading is active. And if I switch it to off, uh, which means false, it will just multiply everything by one. So the edge fading will not have any effect. As you can see, no more particles plop in aggressively and randomly. And I think that's even better to observe if I scale up the cube like this. You can look for a group input node and expose all those cool group parameters. So let's say, for example, you could take this switch output and connect it here. And now you can switch the edge fading off in the modifier window. I'm still waiting for the Blender devs to turn this 0, 1 value into an actual usable uh, tick switch, however you call it. I'm assuming it has some logical explanation that I'm too stupid to understand, but I really wish that we could get a nicer input here at Blender devs. <laughs> well, um, have a nice evening.